Well, I would definitely address that. I mean, I would address that that comment no matter what. I'm like, well, talk, let's talk about this and how you know we'll talk about the informed consent. And I just want to make sure that we're open about it because one thing I'm not going to ignore it because it's going to make that client feel some type of way. And I don't want that to happen. Absolutely. We have to have yep. an honest discussion. And I would definitely explain that you do understand that it's in my form consent that I will not respond as long. And you know, it depends if she's like, oh yeah, I know Miss Marlowe. I knew you weren't going to say nothing. Mm -hmm. Then we've discussed it. Welcome to the Colleague Down the Hall podcast. This episode is sponsored by the Collab Oasis Clinical Consultation Groups. Hi, I'm Janine Wolf, and I'm your colleague down the hall. I have a passion for helping fellow therapists get the clinical and collegial support we all need to do this work. And wow, it just keeps getting harder every day. I'm the founder and facilitator of the Collab Oasis Clinical Consultation Groups. I have been a social worker for almost 30 years, and I own a successful solo online private practice. More of us than ever are practicing in solo or online practices, and we all need colleagues to process cases with, commiserate with on those really hard days, and also to celebrate our successes with. In this podcast, I'll bring you insights about trends and changes in our field and sit down with amazing therapists who are doing amazing work. We'll discuss fictionalized cases, ways to practice sustainably, and of course, there will be plenty of laughing. I love laughing with friends. I'm so glad to have you as one of my colleagues down the hall. Abby is a 25-year-old who came to therapy to address symptoms of anxiety. Treatment goals include reducing her anxiety, increasing socialization with peers, and improving her self-esteem. Abby has gone out of her way to try to extract information about the therapist's personal life during sessions. She's now begun to follow the therapist's professional Instagram account and frequently comments on posts, including indicating that she's a client. Okay, do we have clarifying questions about Abby and her therapist? Well, I love this example. One of my clients just actually, uh, I mean, I have in detail in my informed consent, yep. of how I respond to social media things and all of that nature. So this is very interesting. First of all, it sounds like she's the one who's breaking confidentiality. Client. In terms of she's the one, it's not the therapist. She's yes. the one who's on the Instagram page and says, oh, I'm a client. I, but I still wouldn't respond. I personally would not respond to an mm -hmm. uh, uh, Instagram post, even mm -hmm. if she says, hey, Miss Marlowe, she's a great therapist, love our sessions. Yes. I would not discuss, I would still not respond, but we will have our conversation in, in, in okay. a private session. Marla, would you leave the comment there or would you delete it? Now that's a good question. I never thought about that. Huh. Delete. That, that was delete actually it. my first question too. Yeah. I don't I don't have an answer. <laughs> I, would, I would actually go the opposite direction. I would keep it there. Okay. Well, because she's the one who's, who, that's a, I, let me process for a second. Okay. And this was brought up in an ethics training and there was no solution provided except that you need to cross your T's and dot your I's. In terms of, like Marlo said, in your informed consent, you need to have a very clear social media policy about how you, if a client were to reach out with your professional social media, hopefully not your personal, that's a whole other ball of wax, well, um, and how, never, what the expectation and how you would manage it is. Well, I never had, like, that's a good question, whether I delete it, but I will tell you what my informed consent says about that. If you reach out to me, it says something in, in, in effect, if you, because we all have business pages, I mean, a lot of us do. So that is what it is. It's a, a business page. But what I did say is, if you if you say something and you respond, I I know I will not respond. That's that's in my like I will not respond and say something. Another clause is if you see me out in Kroger, and our mm -hmm. eyes meet, I will not respond to you. I will not I will not say hi. However, if you come to me and say hello, I will say hello. I will not just ignore you. Yeah. So my, my it's very specific, but I don't have it. I don't have, I, I don't know if I would delete it though. Yeah. So Marlo, in that example about Kroger, 
I've learned over the years that I have to take that one step further. And it's likely that you do this as well. I say, okay, so you say hi to me and come up and greet me. And I greet you back and you're with a friend who says, oh, who is this? Are you comfortable saying this is my therapist? Because if you're not comfortable saying this is my therapist, then you need to ignore me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you need to not come over and say hello to me because they don't always take that, that extra step. Mm -hmm. So, so I'm wondering, so then this has happened and now you have a, you have a session with her coming up. What are your thoughts about where are you going to go with this? If at all in your session? Well, I would definitely address that. I mean, I would address that, that comment, no matter what. I'm like, well, talk, let's talk about this and how, you know, we'll talk about the informed consent. And I just want to make sure that we're open about it. Cause one thing I'm not going to ignore it because it's going to make that client feel some type of way. And I don't want that to happen. Absolutely. We have to have yep. an honest discussion. And I would definitely explain that you do understand that it's in my form consent that I will not respond as long. And you know, it depends if she's like, oh yeah, I know Miss Marlowe. I knew you weren't going to say nothing then we've discussed it right kind of sort of, you know, if that makes sense yeah. I'm, I'm simplifying it <laughs> yeah yeah absolutely okay so I think that other piece that in the in this kind of case you're presenting is that this person's been trying to extract information trying to figure yeah. out more information too so I feel like that's an additional an additional layer in the mix yes. I personally don't feel like I would delete the comment I'd probably discuss it first in session and check in surrounding it. But I think like my clinical kind of yellow orange flags would be raised at this point saying, okay, mm -hmm. what's going on here? And is this going to keep happening in comments or, or what's this about? But I think I'm inclined that I talk about it first and then pull the client into that decision-making process. Maybe they don't really have any stigma or concern about people knowing they're in therapy. And I'd also hate to like crush that and say yeah. like, gosh, you should have stigma and shame. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Great, great point. Absolutely. And, and depending on what generation we're talking about, mm -hmm. they have very different perspectives about sharing, being in therapy, opening up about like everything on social media. There are, you know, younger generations who are a-okay with all of that. And yes. so being respectful that you want to hear their perspective, make sure you're cautioning them about the possible implications of this. And if they didn't think three steps ahead, maybe they would choose to delete the comment, but you've explored all that with them. And, and so additionally, I love the point that what are factors in the therapeutic relationship that possibly are contributing to this? I, I think it's pretty natural when we have certain clients and, and certainly newer clients, they want to know more about us. Yes. And that over time can be really draining on a therapist because at times you feel like, I want my personal life to be about me. You know, like sometimes you feel like all your clients are trying to suck all your like personal stuff out of you. And that can feel very vulnerable. And each therapist has to decide how much self-disclosure is appropriate in sessions. So in terms of those factors, I think Allison raised a good point that this is already coming up in other ways. You've resisted sharing. So now they're trying to come at a different angle. So revisiting boundaries would be a very important conversation yeah. to have. Very absolutely. Much. Yes, absolutely. absolutely. And, and another place my, my mind went with it because, you know, the, the treatment goals are surrounding socialization and self-esteem. And so yeah. Uh, you know, wondering kind of what, what skills they already have or, or where those skills are lacking, because, you know, I could see from, from this client's perspective, okay, look, see, I'm being social. I'm going and, and, and trying to get to know somebody better. And it's just sort of misplaced. And so helping them, okay, let's build those skills and put them elsewhere, not trying to get to know more about me, your therapist on a personal mm -hmm. level. Mm -hmm. Would this cause anyone to maybe do an assessment for a personality disorder? Yes, immediately. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It, it crossed my mind. I don't know if I would guess immediately, but it definitely is something I would kind of yeah. put a pin in as far it's as on your radar. Mm -hmm. We're going to keep an eye on that. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Something I would also keep a lookout for just with her, you know, potential boundary issue here is, and this is the private practice I work at has a Facebook page. And I had a client who commented like, 
you know, Lisa's the best therapist ever. I love working with her, like a very open about that sort of thing. And when I was talking to my supervisor about it, something she brought up that I didn't even think about was the potential for some sort of not, not exactly secondary gain, but almost like kind of collateral sort of expectation of like, I'm doing something nice for you by saying nice yes. things about you. Give me something. Yeah. So I would definitely be look, on the lookout for that. Yes, because, uh, you know, we often have those clients that want to be the favorite client and they want to do things that are going to make you like them more. So that is absolutely an implication that we would want to look at here, that what is their expectation if they're doing this for you as far as the therapeutic relationship goes? Great point, Elise. Any other thoughts? And without sharing any specific cases, any other related scenarios that you can imagine might occur that we would want to, as far as social media goes, that we want to be aware of and make sure that we're, you know, again, like putting that like note to self, let me keep an eye on this area. I, I just have, I'm when I think about social media and then what you guys were talking about, you know, the therapist and what how the client is doing something for them by giving I don't even I'm I'm not a fan of reviews I just mm -hmm. think that's yep like I'm not a fan of like if my client was to say to me Miss Marlowe that I see Miss Marlowe because a lot of my clients call me Miss Marlowe yes sure it's sure. like uh -huh. Miss Marlowe um can I write a re review on your Google and I'm like I would prefer not to do that I, yeah I I don't know I I just I'm not, I do see some, you know, when I see other, um, and which is, which is okay. I mean, if it's okay and it's not providing any HIPAA violations or things like that, I just prefer not to either ask my clients for reviews. And if they ask me they to give me a review, I usually say, you know what, you don't have to do that. Please, mm -hmm. you know, and we talk about it and yeah, I don't know. I just, I'm feel I feel funny about that. Yeah, that's a great point, Marlo. And that does, again, vary by your licensing board and your professional organization as far as their perspective is that of that goes. Even as far as like in social worker, a client is always a client. I know there are some licensure types where like after five years, you no longer ha have the obligation of them being a client, but with social work, it's forever and ever. And so also, I think there's some variation with that as far as reviews go. And so I think most of them say that soliciting reviews is not appropriate. Yeah. Some people, some organizations might say, okay, well, if a client gives you a review, you can use the review with no name or, or possibly just initials, but it's up to each of us to decide when that client sitting in the room and say, you have really changed my life. This work has been so powerful. I would love to give you, you know, a positive review. And then we can decide based on our own regulations and our own values and all the other factors that we look at with cases. Do I want to thank them so much and explain to them that, that I prefer not to have that because it's complicated. It can lead to other scenarios that you can't always anticipate. Or is it okay to say, yes, thank you. What, you know, I'm not soliciting it from you, but you've offered this to me. So yes, that's lovely. I would appreciate that. And I see what they do. I think the difference also, I think what some therapists are doing is they're accepting it on their website, but not on the Google scenario situation. Yeah. So I'm not yeah. really that technically inclined, well, but they are allowed to do it on their website or something. I think the other <laughs> tricky piece with Google, because it's public, anybody can post anything for anyone on Google. And so I feel like if, you know, if a client, like there's, I think a certain sense of autonomy for them that we have to respect as well, that if a client just out of nowhere, just like if you ate at a great restaurant and you're like, oh, I'm gonna to go to their, their webpage and leave a Google review. If a client chooses to do that, it, not taking that that voice or that choice away from them because, mm -hmm. you know, it's I think it's one thing if they say it to you in a session, like, oh, I really wanna do this versus just, oh, look, somebody posted something on Google. Absolutely, yeah, yeah, okay. I want to thank you all for your participation today. Again, this is one of those things where it's not black and white. We have to use our best judgment. We need to consult with colleagues, 
document, document, document. I know that for myself, I really was not trained on how to document consultation. And so I really encourage others to do that, not on every case, but certainly in cases where there is a gray area that you've explored and want to make sure, because if it's not in the chart, it doesn't count, right? Right. So making sure that you are doing this for your own protection as well as your client. So thank you all again for being here today. Thank you so much for listening to the Colleague Down the Hall podcast. For show notes, links, and downloads, head over to colleaguedownthehall.com where you'll be able to learn more about getting the clinical support you need and resources to help you work in a supported, sustainable way. If you've enjoyed this episode, please share with your therapy friends and colleagues. Subscribe to the podcast. And if you love this episode, please leave a review.